My brother David, did you have a birthday? You got an anniversary or something coming up? I shouldn't have asked you. I'm so sorry. All right. Uh, did, I, did we pray over the offering? Did y'all come to give? Uh, I'm just picking on him. Amen. Let's stand. Go to, uh, I want to turn your attention to John chapter number 8. I love you. <laughs> well, you got to love me, man. I love you too. Praise the Lord. I'm so sorry. If y'all need to talk after church, I'll, I'll stay as long as you need to. <laughs> hey, get with me after church. I'll remind you. Ooh, it's going to be one of them services. Amen. I'm glad because I like those kind of sentences. John chapter number 8. I feel like I have something for somebody um, tonight. Uh, I feel like it's going to be an on-time word for somebody. I wasn't planning on going this direction until just a couple of hours ago. And um, so we'll see what the Lord will do. I had something else in mind for tonight. Uh, but I woke up this morning and uh, got in the closet for a little while and spent some time with Jesus and then spent a little bit of time in his word. And just a couple hours ago, I came across this and I feel like it's going to be right on time for somebody. At least it's on time for me. Amen. Uh, if for no other reason than just a good reminder for somebody tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. John chapter number 8. And I want to begin reading at verse number 1. Please pardon me for the lengthy reading, but I do want to get a good bit of this. Amen. If you get tired of standing, you're, you're welcome to be seated. But uh, I want to begin at verse number 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning... He came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Um, I want to pull from this, from this passage, this text, and I want to hopefully preach to you for a few minutes tonight on this subject. Jesus gets the last word. Amen. Jesus gets the last word. One more time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's take this service to him. Jesus, we are coming boldly. We're approaching God. We're asking you that you would bless this service. God, I know that there are people in this in this congregation tonight, myself included, that this is going to be an on-time word for them. God, that you have something particular that you want to speak to somebody that is here tonight. I didn't know who was going to be here. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize, God, what was going to be taking place here tonight. To, God, it wasn't until just a couple hours ago, Lord, that this was dropped on me. 
God, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would bring it all together and you would make sense out of it, God, and that you would help me to deliver it with a passion and with a burden, God, so that somebody can leave tonight knowing without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus, that you're going to get the last word and that your word is good and your word is faithful and your word is true. And we're asking you to bless this service in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. All right, look up here and smile. Lord, I want you to get out of your seat, shake somebody by the hand, look them in the eye, and tell them Jesus gets the last word. tonight, man, woman, and child, all of us um, are under the Old Testament condemned. There is not one among us that could fulfill the law of Moses as it was intended to be fulfilled. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that there is none that are righteous. None that are good, no, not one. Um, I love what he says in Romans chapter number 7. Um, because it's so pertinent to, to myself. Where he, he begins to discuss his flesh and um, his weaknesses. And if, if you don't mind, I'll just read a little bit of it. He says... Uh, for we know that the law is spiritual, but he says, I am carnal, yes. sold under sin. Uh -huh. He says, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that, I, that do I not. But what I hate, that do, that I do. Yeah. He's basically saying the things that are good that I'm trying to do, I don't end up doing them. Uh -huh. And the things that are bad that I try to get as far away from them as I possibly can. Those are the things that I end up doing. And he goes on in that same chapter to just, it, it, you know, this is just how I read it. But it's, it's like he just kind of throws both fists up in the air and he just, oh, wretched man that I am. Who, who will deliver me from the body of this day? I thank God for chapter 8. Because chapter 8 is all about the delivering power. It's all about the spirit. It's the contradiction. Paul's talking about the weakness that he experiences in his flesh. But when you turn the page over into chapter 8, all of a sudden you get to get strength that you draw from the spirit. And verse number 1 says, there is therefore now. Look at somebody and say right now. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So when you find yourself struggling to do right, I know what I gotta do. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know what's right, but I it's so hard to do it. And I know the things that are wrong, and I'm I'm supposed to abstain from those things, but it's those things that I find myself doing. But there is therefore now no condemnation. You just got to get in Christ. That's the answer. You got to get full of the Holy Ghost. You got 
to get in Christ Jesus. Who walketh not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. Every one of us are like that woman in our text today. We've all been caught in the very act. It may not have been adultery. But you've been caught in the very act of sin. I've been caught. You've been caught. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. He's watching. And we've all been caught. How many of you like me uh, could lift up your hand? You could stand up and you could testify one after one about if it had not been for the mercy of God. I don't know where I'd be tonight if it had not been for the mercy of God. I'm so thankful, Sister Dunn, that I didn't get what I deserved. Oh, thank you, God, for your mercy. Because if we got what we deserved, we'd get hell. If we got what we deserved, it'd be punishment. It would be judgment. We should have been the one hanging on Calvary. That's what we deserved. But you need to look at somebody and you tell them Jesus gets the last word. Hallelujah. I've come to tell somebody here tonight that there's an opportunity for you to have a brand new start. There's a fresh opportunity. Today can be a brand new start for some man or some woman under the sound of my voice tonight. You get a fresh new start in this service today. Hallelujah. Thankful for a new beginning. That's why I love John chapter 8. This story about this woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Jesus in his word is painting a beautiful picture of his mercy. And a woman that was caught in sin. That gets a do over. That gets a brand new beginning. That gets a fresh start. Somebody say amen. We don't know a whole lot about her. We don't know her name. We don't know who she was prior to uh, this text. We don't know if she became a, a disciple of Jesus after her encounter with mercy here. We don't know if she was among the 120 that were there in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. All we know is that she had an experience at mercy's feet. All we know is that she came in. She was caught in the very act. But she experienced mercy. Hallelujah. Would to God that everybody that had ever experienced mercy in their lives would go on to follow the Lord. But sadly that is not the case. There's too many that are wandering around. They, they've come to an apostolic altar. They, they've repented of their sins. They had tears rolling down their cheek. They, they went down in the water and they came up speaking in tongues. But they're carrying around the shame and the regret and the weight of bad decisions on their shoulder. And they go on and walk out those doors unable to follow the Lord. Because they're so ashamed. And that shame and that regret keeps them from following Jesus. But I've come to, I've come to encourage somebody tonight. Yes. Jesus is not in the business of trying to embarrass you. Jesus is not all about trying to single you out and let everybody in the church know all of your faults and all of your failures. He's not trying to call you out by name and identify, well, I know where you were on this night and I know what you were doing last weekend and I'm going to get the pastor and anoint him and he's going to prophetically call your name out and all your dirty laundry. Jesus is not in the business of trying to call out all of your dirty laundry. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but that excites me. That makes me want to shout hallelujah. That makes me want to praise I'm so glad my pastor didn't get up that first Sunday morning that I showed up at church and get up and just read my mail in front of all the church. Somebody say amen. Let me tell you something, Truthway. If you knew all about me and you knew all about my past, right? I don't know if you'd be too thrilled about having me as a pastor. Come on, come on. Come on. 
You might want to go find you another pastor. But let me tell you something. If you choose to, you won't get many days and many weeks down the road before you realize that man of God, he's got problems too. And then you'll get another pastor down the road from there and you're going to realize he or she has got a mess of a life too and they've also got a past. We've all got a past. We've all made mistakes. Every one of us have been caught in the very act. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Look at somebody tell them all. That means you. That means that good looking man sitting next to you, Sister Carlos. Him too. That means that good looking lady sitting next to you. Her too. You got a secret. You, hey, maybe you hadn't been caught in the very act. That just means you got away with it. But I tell you one that has an all seeing eye. That sees everything you've ever done. And while you may have gotten by me. And you may have gotten by your spouse. And you may not have been found out. And publicly accused. There is one that sees all. And he knows all. You've been caught in the very act. God encouraging word for you. Jesus yes. is the last word. Yes. Yes. They said to Jesus in our text, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. The law says judgment. The law says sin must be dealt with. It punishable by death. The death penalty. Moses told us how to deal with those that were caught in the very act. But then they turned to Jesus and said, but what sayest thou? Jesus, what's your verdict? What do you have to say about the matter? What's the last word that you have to say? I know what we're supposed to do. I've got book that backs it up. Really, they were trying to back Jesus in a corner. Are you going to do what the what the book says or are you going to go your own way? What's the final word, Jesus? What sayest thou? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the accusers don't get the last word? Because if the accuser gets the last word, hallelujah, I would have never amounted to much. Because that's what the accuser said about me. If the accuser gets the last word, then you would have turned out just like your uncle. And you would have had a drinking problem or a drug problem. Or you would have turned out just like your daddy who was running around on your mama and couldn't hold a job. If the accuser got the last word. I'm so glad Jesus gets the last word. Hallelujah. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger he wrote in the ground as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground twice. Jesus did this where he stooped down and he begins to write on the ground. And uh, There's a lot of opinions out there and I've heard and read about many of them. Some say that Jesus stooped down into the dust of the ground and he began to, he began to write the Ten Commandments out. Some suggest that he, he bent down and one by one he began to Bobby Perkins, oh my, come on. write their names in the dirt. And then the associated sin with the name. Mm -hmm. And then the date next uh -huh. to that. <laughs> My God. Can I tell you a joke? <laughs> I heard a joke one time. It's kind of a crude joke, but it is what it is. It's a shame that this probably actually uh, has happened or could happen. But it was a joke about two men... They would get together on Monday mornings and they would meet up for breakfast and then they would go bike riding. They'd meet up at uh, their favorite restaurant on Monday mornings, two preachers. And, and they'd go bike riding after breakfast. And one Monday morning, two preachers met up at their favorite restaurant, but one of them was walking. Normally he was riding his bike, but he was walking. 
The other preacher said to his buddy, hey man, where's your bike? What, what's going on? We can't ride bikes today. Where's your bike at? Oh, brother, I don't know, man. I, I think somebody in the church stole it. Somebody in my church stole my bike. And I don't know what to do. Well, I, I got an idea. Next Sunday morning when you're preaching, you get up there and you begin to preach on the Ten Commandments. And when you get to that one that says, thou shalt not steal, somebody in the congregation is going to start feeling guilty. They're going to get convicted and they're going to repent. They're going to come and they're going to confess. And they'll bring your bike back to you. Sure enough, man, that following mo Monday morning, his buddy showed up at the restaurant riding his bicycle. Woo, hey, it worked. You did what I said and it worked, didn't it? Well, man, I did what you said. I, man, I got to preaching about the Ten Commandments. And I got all the way to that one that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And then I remembered where my bike was. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus kneeling down on the ground and writing the sins of those men that were there? The Bible says one by one, beginning at the eldest, they began to drop their stones. Hallelujah. Now, now, truthfully, none of us really know what Jesus had wrote in the sand. And, and, and really what he wrote wasn't necessarily that important because had it been important, it would have been in, in the word of God. But, but what's interesting and what is important according to the word, not what he wrote, but what he said. Because the Bible says when they heard him, the Bible says it brought conviction. Look at verse number 9 in John 8. They which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. Yes. When they heard his statement. He that is without sin among you. Let him first cast a stone. Yes. And then he bends over and he begins to write a second time. He's, he's obviously giving these men a time to think about their own lives. And about their own mistakes. And about their own shame and regret that's weighing down on their shoulders. And again, at the eldest, uh, they one by one began to drop their stones. Uh, the scripture saying that they being convicted by their own conscience. Uh -huh. That stood out to me. By their own conscience, at the very word of God that they had heard in their ears, they began to remember their own faults. They began to remember, oh wait, uh, she's not in this by herself because I too deserve the same punishment. Every one of them in that circle of men that were there accusing this woman, all of them and all of us are guilty because we've all been caught in the very act and we all deserve equal punishment. I couldn't help but be reminded of scriptures uh, uh, that, that, that say things like uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What a shame that we're living in a day and an hour when a man and a woman and a, and a family or, or people can stand in a church house and they can hear the preaching of the word of God and not feel guilty about living wrong. We can get ourselves to a place where we have our conscience seared. In other words, we become numb. Like one scripture that says being past feeling. You get yourself to a place where you just can't feel conviction anymore. You can't feel the fact that I've done things that, that, that are wrong. And I've done things that are, are I regret those decisions that I've made. I, I'm ashamed of, of my, my choices. I, I, I'm so sorry. And we, we get ourselves like a dog that goes back to the vomit. The very thing that that dog ate that made that dog sick and vomit, he 
just runs right back to it, eats it up, and gobbles it up again. Or like the hog. You wash that thing up so good, you clean it, and what's it do as soon as you release it? Runs right back to that same nasty walla. Yeah. And he says, people are just like that. They get themselves to a place where I was I was reading uh, I was reading that book uh, this morning, Brother Dunn, and she was talking about the memory. She was talking about your memory and how how we become uh, just so um, we hunger for the pleasures of life. That, that if we're not spirit filled and we're not constantly renewing our minds in the Holy Ghost, uh, we get to a place where all we can do is remember. Our memory is just constantly replaying the pleasures of the past. Uh, and before you know it, uh, the God that cleaned us up, the God that washed us off, uh, we just run right back out there to that nasty stuff that he delivered us from. That's how you become a past feeling. That's how you sear your conscience with a hot iron. You just keep going back. You got to make up your mind. Ask for me in my house. We're going to serve the Lord. You know what? As a church, we can't ever get. We got to be careful, folks. We can't ever get to the place uh, where we can just look at somebody and we're just so judgmental that, that we just say, well, you know what? They're not interested in the things of God. Come on. Come on. They don't look like us and they don't dress like us and they don't worship like us and, and they don't pray like us. Well, hey, can I just remind you of where you were when God found you? Come on. Come on. Come on. You weren't exactly holy. Yes. You weren't exactly a prayer warrior. And such were some of you. That's right. uh, but you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You have been justified. Somebody say praise the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the spirit of our God. But mercy and Jesus have the last word. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Let's all stand. Go and sin no more. That's the last word. That's mercy's last word. I'm not condemning you. But you can't go back. You can't go back to that sin. You've got to, you've got to keep going forward, my friend. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Neither do I. What a beautiful word. Amen. I'm telling you, I, I, I hate to repeat myself, but I'm glad the accusers didn't have the last word. Amen. Because then you'd have a little lady that made a mistake. Yeah, she made a mess. Uh -huh. Caught in the very end. Yes, yes. Underneath the pile of stones. Uh -huh. If the accusers had the last word. Yes, yes. But I'm glad that mercy has the final say in my life. I'm glad that Jesus has the last word in this church. And he says, neither do I condemn thee. But you can't continue in your sin. Go and sin no more. My Lord. I hope this is all right for a Thursday. You know, Brother Dunn, I remember when, when I walked into Truthway Church on a Sunday morning for the first time. October 30th. 2005 It was a Sunday morning It was the day before Halloween Ezekiel I remember that because I had a big Halloween party Planned for that, that Monday night I Had guests that were planning on being there I, I would be embarrassed To tell you The things that had taken place that Saturday night and that Friday night. I don't want you to know about those things. I'm not going to preach those things. There's some things of my past that I, I'll, if I if I think it'll help, I'll, I'll preach about it. But there's some things that nobody needs to know. I'd be embarrassed. But to su suffice it to say that I should have been rejected at the door. 
they when when they took one look at me, they they should have said, you know what? Not they could have said, you're you're not welcome. You're not welcome here. Because Chris, I had made a lot of messes in my life. I had I had a lot of regrets, a lot of shame, a lot a lot of failure. But I I remember Ezekiel in that church that Sunday morning. I remember listening to a voice that was greater than the voice of the accuser. I remember my pastor standing up in that pulpit and preaching a message. He titled it, The Fear of Falling. And, and I couldn't tell you, Brother Bobby, a whole lot about what was said that day. But I can tell you very, very vividly and with a whole lot of detail about what I felt while the preaching was going on. Because I was still sensitive. I was a sinner boy. I was a mess. But I was not past feeling. I could feel God pulling on me. I can feel the tug of the Holy Ghost. I can tell you about how I walked up to an altar that day and my knees were just a knocking. I was shaking Sister Krista under the power of God's Spirit. And when the Holy Ghost fell on me, I can tell you about how I was speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God moved on me. With such detail, I can tell you about those things. I don't remember a whole lot about the message. All I remember is that I knew that, that I was living in sin. And, and I was so scared, Ezekiel, that I was going to be smoking a blunt and the rapture was going to happen. I was so scared, Slate, that I was going to be drinking uh, a beer and the rapture was going to happen. And I was going to miss it. And that man of God got up that day and he preached a message titled The Fear of Falling. I used to have a CD of it, but I gave it away. I wish I wouldn't have, but I hope whoever I gave it to got as much out of it as I did. Yes. I was so scared, Ezekiel, that I was going to be out there slipping around, messing up, living in sin, and boom, I was going to miss it. And he got up and he preached a message specifically to me. About the fear of falling. The fear of being lost. And I'm telling you. Just as much as this is on time for somebody tonight. That was on time for me. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes. Look friend. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what some kind of sin you're involved in. All I know is. Is that you like the rest of us. Have been caught in the very act. And I want to encourage you and let you know that you're welcome in this place. We want you here. You may have regrets of what you did Friday night. You may have made some bad decisions last night or today before church. You may be ashamed of your behavior and your conduct. And maybe you, maybe you made a scene and you acted up and you have a whole lot of regrets because of it. But I've come today to remind you that Jesus has the last words. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I've come to encourage somebody today that you can get in Christ Jesus. That heavy burden of shame, that weight of guilt and regret that has been bearing down on your back so long. He wants to pluck that thing off of you tonight. He wants to remove that burden from you tonight. If you'll just come to this altar and you'll begin to repent of your sin. And you'll begin to tell Jesus, Jesus, I've made a mess. Jesus, I'm sorry for my mistakes. Jesus, I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of. I've hurt people. I've done people wrong. I've made messes, God. But I'm asking you to forgive me. If you'll do it for that woman caught in the very act, then you can do it for me. These altars are open tonight. If anybody wants to come and let Jesus speak the last word into your life, 
If anybody wants to come, come on, friend. You've been listening to the accuser long enough. You've been listening to family that's been running you down and telling you that you deserve everything you've gotten. You've been listening to family that's been telling you you're never going to amount to much. You've been listening to all the accusers that have been running you down and telling their sad story about you and telling you that you deserve come to tell you tonight, Jesus has the last word, and his word is a word of mercy. Come on, let the Lord speak that last word into your life tonight. Neither do I condemn thee. Go. No. And sin no more.
worship the Lord.
He's trying to lift you. God's going to begin to deal with you about your finances. He's trying to lift you. God's going to begin to deal with you about habits, about hang-ups, about struggles. He's trying to lift you. And if you'll obey, the process is a whole lot smoother and faster. And you just, you're blessed. But, Brother Dunn, it's a choice, right? It's your choice. You can make this process a long, drawn-out process. And you'll end up being like so many that have been living for God for 50 years. And they still can't quote scripture. They still don't, they still don't, you know, know how to cast out devils. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Been living for God all their lives, been raised in church, and still still get offended when the pastor walks right on by them to greet a guest. I got I got oh I got a little something working on me, but I want to save it. I want to save it. No, I don't. I want to give it to you right now. Please, I want you to get the humor in this, okay? I want you to get the humor in this, and then I'll, I'll dismiss you. I was going to save this, but I already told one crude joke here, so let me tell a few more. Um, there is a scripture. There is a scripture that talks about a death and a dumb spirit. And, and the disciples said, well, why can't we cast, cast this spirit out? And Jesus says, well, these spirits can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. And, and so I was planning on preaching a message about the dumb spirit. And I still might somewhere down the road. But I was thinking, how many of you have ever heard of Jeff Foxworthy? He's a comedian. He, I wouldn't recommend listening. But um, he does that. Uh, you might be a redneck if joke. If you if you got duct tape on your car or whatever, you might. Anyway, okay. So here's the joke. You might have a dumb spirit if you might have a dumb spirit if you can't afford to pay your tithe. But you were at the casino last night. Come on, come on. You might have a dumb spirit if this isn't it doesn't have anything to do with you. Y'all y'all just happen to be here, okay? You might have a dumb spirit if you can't buy baby formula, but you you're gonna have a of cigarettes. Does that make sense? You might have a dumb spirit if your water's been cut off because you hadn't paid your bill, but you watch a pay-per-view on a 72-inch big screen. I'm so sorry, y'all. I, I messed up a perfectly good sermon, brother. The point is, God is trying to get people's attention and if you choose to do it your own way, it's going to become a long, drawn-out process. And you're going to find yourself having been living for God for 35 years, still needing somebody to pat you on the back and birth you like a baby. Or you can just be obedient to what God says and obey the preaching and obey the leading of the Spirit and let God lift you and bless you because that's what He wants to do. That's everything. That's, that's, that's all I got. I, I messed this thing up. I'm so sorry. I have messed it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so glad Jesus gets the last word. I love you all. Let's all stand. I love you all very, very much. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Slade, Kenzie, I'm so glad that y'all came and brought that beautiful baby. Thank you so much.
Judy, Ezekiel, I'm glad y'all made it tonight. We appreciate y'all very much. Amen. I'm glad for all of the regular customers. Amen. The saints of the Most High God. Brother Dunn, if you would, say a prayer and dismiss us.